Welcome to Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, the weekly podcast that features the very best in career development in the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Patton McDowell, and committed to bringing you ideas and resources that will build your professional development plan. First of all, thank you for listening. If you want to be a nonprofit leader or maybe just more effective in the leadership role you have now, you're in the right place. I'm glad to bring you these weekly episodes with nonprofit leaders and topics that will keep you on the cutting edge of our sector. If you would, do me a favor. Find that share button. Usually it's a button on the top or maybe on the bottom of the episode graphic of this episode. And you'll find three dots. It'll give you lots of options to share the episode with one other person so that we can continue to build a global community focus on nonprofit leadership. Well, I've got a special episode for you, and I hope to turn it into a resource that you can contemplate and reflect upon as you drive along or jog along or run along, whatever method that you multitask around podcast listening. I want to give you something to think about. And I hope the takeaways from this episode will help you evaluate and, in fact, improve your nonprofit leadership. I've been fortunate now to work with almost 250 nonprofit organizations and their leaders. And, of course, this podcast has been a fascinating opportunity to interview now over 120 nonprofit leaders from around the world. And it has sharpened my focus on the key characteristics that I believe make the best nonprofit leaders succeed. And I'm hopeful that you'll listen and it will give you something to think about, not only in terms of improving your areas and skills and experiences, but think about these things and how you might bring them to your organization, either your current nonprofit or perhaps your future nonprofit as you build a plan. Now, a preface I'll give to these concepts, there are five of them around which I believe the best nonprofit leaders focus. Uh, there is a clear characteristic that allows them to focus on these five things, which is carving out time for strategic thought and strategic leadership. I have no doubt that every one of you are immersed in daily activity. Uh, sometimes it is, in fact, a grind. It is overwhelming. You can be drowning in tactical activity just to keep your nonprofit organization in motion. And I get that. Let me offer this insight as well. If you contemplate having a conversation with me about your nonprofit leadership journey, these are the topics we'll talk about. And you may notice on our homepage there's an opportunity to schedule a no-obligation conversation about your organization or your leadership journey, and I really enjoy that. And I've been fortunate, again, to work with and coach many top nonprofit leaders, and we'll be happy to talk to you about your journey as well. These are also the topics we discuss in our mastermind programs. So, yes, I'm going to do a commercial for that. We're in our fifth cohort right now having fantastic conversations with really impressive nonprofit leaders from all over the country. And they're exploring these topics and helping support each other, identifying resources. And so I hope this episode will give you a taste of that. And like I said earlier, give you a chance to self-assess. Where do you fall in terms of these categories if you are assessing yourself? And what might you work on to help you be even more confident as a nonprofit leader? All right, let's jump into these. The first of the five priorities that the best nonprofit leaders manage to focus is what I call sharpening their vision. The best leaders can effectively define and articulate success for their nonprofit, often in ways that many organizations do not. And let me explain that further. Uh, to me, there is a sequence of articulation of the best nonprofits and their leaders do this by articulating a mission, vision, and then action. Again, mission, vision, action. Most nonprofit organizations, if I go to your website right now, I'll have no problem finding in some poetic fashion your mission statement. In fact, what exactly you do as a nonprofit organization. However, the best nonprofit leaders take that articulation of mission and make sure they elevate 
to an explanation of vision. Where is their nonprofit organization going? I'm convinced that those organizations rally support both financial, volunteer, and in the community because they can articulate clearly a vision for success. They're proud of what they're doing now. Their mission statement is clear. They're doing that program, that service, that outreach that their mission articulates. But they can also plant a flag into the future and say, hey, we're serving 1,000 children right now in our community, but we know there are 10,000 more that need us. In the next five years, we're going to get to half of them. Notice again, without overwhelming the listener with numbers, the articulate and successful nonprofit leader plants a flag, sets a goal, and articulates a vision that someone can understand. Wow, it's great that you're serving a 1,000 kids, but I didn't even know that there are 10,000 more that need this type of service. That, to me, is a wonderful articulation of vision that the best nonprofit leaders can do. And I bet you can do this, too. You can translate this mission, vision, action formula into your organization's context. Mission's what we do. Vision is where we're going. There is a genuine need, and we're going to get there. Maybe we're going to get to half of them in this whatever time period you feel comfortable and confident to share. But notice the third element here. Third element is the best nonprofit leaders can provide a compelling hook if you will, as to why your involvement, your financial support, your understanding is crucial right now. And so while our goal of vision might be to get to half of these 10,000 kids that need our services, we need you right now because we're setting up a new workshop in the eastern part of our community that literally will allow you to get involved as a volunteer or a donor or some sort of action step. What is the call to action that you can articulate so that someone can say, wow, I'm learning from you, but now I see literally how to get involved. Again, the best nonprofit leaders can articulate that mission, vision, action. In fact, I find it to be a highly effective one pager to share with your organization leaders, your colleagues, your staff, your volunteers. Everyone should have a sense of this ladder, if you will, of mission, vision, action, and everyone will then be more effective articulating what you as a nonprofit leader need to start with, which is sharpening your vision for the organization. Everyone talks about building the team and creating a good environment for talent, but I don't see a lot of nonprofit leaders literally doing things that invest in the attraction and retention of their best people. It's one thing to have a job description. It's one thing to do an annual review or evaluation process. But what I want to see from the best nonprofit leaders is a clearly defined professional development plan for each member of the team. Do you spend time talking about that progression that you can get from every member of your team? Not just meeting their goals, but defining what is the next step in their professional journey. Because if they get better, the organization gets better. I love to see specific written professional development goals that incorporate assessments of each individual, but allows them to define, here are some skills and experiences I have that I can leverage even further, and here are some areas I need to get better, whether that be knowledge or skill. And each of those things can be broken down, and we can talk about tangible methods and means to get better. Sadly, I don't see that in a lot of nonprofits. I see the evaluation. I see what is often a missed opportunity to take the talent we already have and help them get better. You know, one way to do that that I've seen some nonprofit leaders employ very successfully is encouraging every member of your team to identify a comparative peer within their sector, within the community. In other words, somebody doing their job outside of the organization. So they have someone to bounce ideas off of and to learn from. In fact, what I did in some of my nonprofit leadership days was ask each member of my team to identify someone who is in a similar role that, that you know can relate to the work they're doing, but also to identify an aspirational peer who is the best in class 
at doing your job a similar organization. So in other words, I worked for Special Olympics right out of college, and I was the program director for a state-level organization. And so what I did quickly is ask folks at the national or international office, I asked colleagues that I met at conferences or in other settings, who is considered among the best program directors in the United States, in the region? You know, and it, depending on your organization, your sector, you decide the scope, but encourage you as well as your team to identify the best in class. And I had a fantastic networking opportunity because I was able to connect with the woman in Nebraska or the program director in Nevada uh, that had been identified. They were experienced. They were veterans. And what I found out best of all is they were generous with their time and advice. And so imagine if each of your team members has identified both comparison and aspirational peers the support they get, and they bring that feedback back to your organization, which reinforces your commitment to your talent and a mindset that is focused on talent development. Now, the second part of this focus on talent is, of course, your board of directors. And I hear it over and over from nonprofit leaders. They struggle with how do I find new and maybe more importantly, more effective new board members. And then I ask the question, it's like, all right, what kind of process do you have in place to commit to year-round board development? Not just a wait till the end of the year when people's terms are about to end and then we scramble to find new board members. No, I'm talking about a systematic approach that allows us to continue to identify talent literally year-round. Just like many of you are focused on fundraising and focused on donors that you identify, you cultivate, and ultimately seek an investment from, why aren't you doing that for your board recruits as well? And again, here are some examples I would look for. One, do you have a matrix, if you will, assessing the skills and experiences and demographics of your current board of directors. I find a lot of nonprofits don't do that. And that should be a first step. What do we have in terms of race and age and gender and geography and professional skills and experiences? Look at that on paper and often things will jump out to you very quickly. However you slice it, you will find that there are obvious uh, things that are missing. And that then allows you to move to the second step of board talent development, which is creating the best examples of the type of board member you need. In other words, it's one thing to ask your board and your community, hey, we need new members. But that is vague and I think seldom leads to the kind of uh, opportunities you're hoping for. But if you can say something like, hey, we're looking for someone who understands the medical community in the northern end of our territory or in our community or the western part of the state, notice I've given more specific characteristics of the type of board member we need to create the fully diverse and representative board we want to have. If all of your current past volunteers and board members have that characteristic to search for, I guarantee you'll come up with more ideas. But it's up to you as a nonprofit leader to define the types of board members you're seeking to become a first-class board of directors. And then the final characteristic I'd look for, do you have right now a wish list of board members that you'd like to join your board someday? If you could put together the literal all-star board of directors for your nonprofit, who would be on it? It's a great brainstorming exercise for your current board. And if they don't know literally a name of some of these people, they could begin to brainstorm. You know what? It would be really good to have this type of board member representing this profession or this geography or this ability to give or this ability to create more community dynamic for our board. If you start with that list, it's amazing how that can materialize because you've been intentional about board talent development. All right, let's move on to number three. This is one I would call the best nonprofit leaders are able to evaluate effectively and innovate accordingly. Okay, number three, they evaluate and they innovate. And again, as I said at the outset of this episode, it's easy to get caught up in all of the daily activity. But two questions inherent in the title of this third 
element. Number one, do you have methods in place to measure what you do? And I mean in particular, not just the outputs. In other words, the number of meals you served or the number of kids you tutor, whatever your output is, what we need to track as best we are able is the outcomes. How many of these kids advanced in their education as a result of your tutoring program? How many of these families were able to get back on their feet because of the meals or the housing assistance you were able to provide? How many of these students were able to graduate from your institution and successfully find a job? Those, of course, represent outcomes. It is important that you have the numbers, the volume that represent those things, but you, again, want to make sure you can define the outcomes. And the best nonprofit leaders make the effort to define and then evaluate their progress. The second thing I'm seeing the best nonprofit leaders do in this category in terms of both evaluation and innovation is now more than ever utilizing technology. Um, if your nonprofit cannot adapt and cannot anticipate those kind of advances that technology might allow, you're going to miss out. And of course, we all have had to adapt in a pandemic environment to the better utilization of technology. But your organization is going to remain hybrid regardless of the pandemic's track. Your volunteers, many of your donors, many of your board members are now more accustomed to using technology. And you as an organization have to continue to think about at least evaluate the possibility of can your programs be delivered differently through the advent of new technology. And you have to at least consider those things. I don't mean you shelve everything you're doing now, but I like to see nonprofit leaders who at least on an annual basis evaluate their current programming platform, their fundraising platform, every platform in terms of what adaptability might occur if we were to utilize technology or change our format. And then finally, the best organizational leaders that I've seen in this category in terms of evaluation, they ask the question each year, where could we partner with someone else? How could we grow maybe as a result of this partnership or grow on our own? Because I think you have to be moving forward as a nonprofit. It's not simply doing the same thing you did last year because there are likely more people that need your services. So that could be geographic growth. It could be programmatic increases and in simply the volume of activity you provide. And the point is, do you as a nonprofit leader have a pro forma that would define budgetarily what is necessary to do that? Again, there are investors out there that like what you're doing and would invest significantly if they felt you had the wherewithal and the infrastructure to grow. And so the best nonprofit leaders turn this evaluation mechanism or mechanisms into growth strategy discussions. And so, again, one example might be what would it take budgetarily, organizationally, and from a staff and resource perspective for you to grow? Doesn't mean you have to do it right away, but I think it's an exercise that forces you to think about both growth and efficiency if you were indeed to make that step. All right, here's the fourth item on our list of the top five priorities for the best nonprofit leaders, and it is the focus of these leaders on the relationship management cycle, often called a fundraising cycle or development cycle, whatever term you have heard or used. But I am convinced that the best nonprofit leaders are very intentional about the relationship management. Notice not just the transactions of fundraising, but thinking about all five phases of this relationship cycle that I'm about to describe. And again, it is a cycle that is worthy of your analysis. Perhaps you can look at this as a quick quiz within the larger test that this episode represents as you listen and ponder all five of these concepts. But within this one concept, here are the questions. Number one, do you really understand your potential supporter, the donor the volunteer, whoever that might be, that it contributes mightily to your success? Do you have a method to collect research on these individuals to understand their giving priorities and principles and things like that? 
Do you have a means to prioritize some of the most significant donors to your organization so that they get the time and attention they deserve? You know, that to me is the first of the five elements of this cycle, understanding your donor base and prospective donor base. And then number two is you move into the second phase of this cycle, which is what kind of information do these people need? These individuals, in some cases, they represent businesses or foundations, but it boils down to individuals. Who are they, first of all? Do your homework and collect it in a meaningful way. And then number two, what information are they seeking to better understand your organization? If you've taken your time to listen and learn from your key supporters now and have created infrastructure gathering this data so that you can better understand and build upon these relationships, then you can move to the second phase of this cycle for relationship management, which is, of course, how do you provide the right information? If you know who they are, you understand a bit of their motivation to support you, then you can feed them the type of information they need to better engage with your organization. Now, of course, just because they have more information does not assure that they're going to pull out their checkbook and support you financially. And that's why we have to move to the third and evaluate the third element of our organization's cycle of relationship building. And that's how do we engage these people? How do we engage them? We've identified them through our research. We've developed and delivered information that they want to better understand what we're trying to accomplish. And now we need to bring them more into the fold. An engagement, of course, could be your special event. It could be a tour of your facility, or it could be a one-on-one -on -one coffee with you or a board member. But whatever it is, as you identify your key partners, you identify your key supporters, you give them information, then you evaluate how do you best engage them. And then and only then we talk about asking for money. And that's the fourth of these five cycle elements. And that leads into the best nonprofit leaders evaluating how they do annual giving, how they offer major gift opportunities, what opportunities are there for legacy gifts and the ultimate investment in your mission. But the best nonprofit organizations and their leaders consider this investment phase as the fourth step of this relationship building cycle. And finally, the best organizational leaders assure there's a clear stewardship plan. Now, let me run back all through all five of those for you again. You understand your donors and collect information. You deliver in a effective fashion through your best communication channels the right information. You come up with ways to engage these particular individuals at the level that they want to be engaged. Then you can invite investment. Then you can seek their investment in your organization. And finally, number five, how do you take care of these people? How do you steward them in a manner that keeps them engaged? You can start with what is your gift acknowledgement process. You can talk about how you accept gifts and utilize them in a manner that the donor hopes for. And then you make sure that that ongoing stewardship plan repeats this cycle of talking to and then listening to these supporters so you can continue to inform and literally create a virtuous cycle of investment. Best nonprofit leaders break this down. They don't just stop at how much money did we raise last year. They think intentionally about all five phases so that they can literally assure lifetime supporters. Last but not least, the fifth element that I often find the most engaging conversations occur at board retreats or staff retreats or just conversations I have with nonprofit leaders, and it is the concept of seeking your alliances. I really think the future of the best nonprofits and their leaders is going to be centered around this concept of alliance building. Funders recognize that they can't invest in every good cause. So increasingly, they will look for organizations that are creative and able to work together with other nonprofit leaders in their organizations. So you first have to ask yourself the question, who else serves the population we serve and how might we partner with them in terms of supporting uh, perhaps what we could call the ecosystem uh, that lifts up these individuals, these families, or this cause that your nonprofit supports, but could be even more effective 
if it were in an alliance building mode. All right, so what do you do with this? Well, number one, it is, in fact, being a student of your sector, your community. You can't be heads down only focused on what your nonprofit is doing. You have to look around it and see who else is supporting the same cause that you are and consider what things might complement each other. An exercise I often suggest is you're likely partnering with organizations right now. Well, the exercise would be what are the top three most important partnerships your nonprofit depends on right now? Again, I'll use the example. Maybe you're an after-school tutoring program. Well, you likely have some sort of relationship with the school system. You may have a relationship with public transportation. You may have a relationship with other key funders. The point is identify those key alliances and be intentional in your board and staff planning discussions. How do we make those relationships better? The best nonprofit leaders are constantly asking that question. How can we strengthen those partnerships and those alliances we have right now? And make that part of the annual retreat. And think about tactical ways that we can be better next year. And I guarantee you that becomes very effective information for your funders who want to know that you are working with that organization across town and want to see that you are aware of the larger societal issues you're addressing because you work well together. Now, the second part of that exercise, first, let's strengthen the relationships we have, but let's be creative and think about what would be three additional alliances or partnerships that would benefit the people we serve, okay? And sometimes you have to let your ego go here because maybe there is an organization across town doing something similar to you, and maybe you don't like exactly how they do it, but you need to be ready to respond to the question of why aren't you partnering with them? That doesn't mean you have to do a full-on merger, but maybe there are complementary services. Maybe there are programs you could do together that they cover a certain territory that you don't. The point is, are you as a nonprofit leader proactive in considering alliances that might occur? And maybe it's not right to do right away. This might be an opportunity three years down the road. But I'm convinced the best nonprofit leaders literally spend time each year evaluating their current partnerships as well as those partnerships that might offer a strategic opportunity and be very much mission-focused because that's sometimes what it boils down to. And, yes, sometimes it might mean that our organization needs to merge with somebody else. If that's what's best for our community and the people we serve – you have to be nimble enough to consider that alliance. I think ultimately that kind of alliance mentality is what's going to take the good organizations into that category of being the best organizations, the leaders in their communities, and you as that organizational leader will benefit accordingly. Well, I hope this solo episode has given you lots to think about. And I'm uh, eager to share these concepts because I've learned from some of the best nonprofit leaders in our sector all over the world. And I hope this will help you reflect upon your leadership and things because I know you wouldn't be listening to this episode or this podcast if you weren't committed to getting better. And so in summary, think about how you articulate the vision for your nonprofit organization. Can you convey mission, vision, and action? Number two, what are you doing to develop the talent and professional development of your staff and your board? Do you have mechanisms in place to assure that is a year-round activity, literally a cultural implant that your organization will certainly benefit from? Number three, how do you truly evaluate the outcomes and outputs of your organization? And maybe more importantly, not just evaluate your organization, but do something with it. How might you innovate? How might you utilize technology? How might you build, grow, expand as a result of thoughtful evaluation? Number four, what are you doing to address and improve all five phases of the relationship building cycle? How do you best identify your supporters? What information do you provide? How do you 
allow them to engage in your organization? And then how do you seek an investment in an authentic way and then take care of them once they have done so? And finally, number five, seek your alliances. What are you doing to build the partnerships and alliances you have right now as a nonprofit leader and your organization with others in the community? And then also equally important and perhaps even more fun to consider what kind of opportunities exist in your community, in your region, in your state, even across the country to build an alliance that will help you achieve your mission even more. Pick three. Pick three potential alliances that you could explore over the next year and see where it takes you. As always, thanks for listening, and don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode. It's number 127. Just go to the podcast or the news page at patmcdowell.com. And by the way, you'll notice the podcast page is the new and improved podcast page. You can find out more information about this episode, but maybe equally important, you can find information about all 127 episodes of this podcast. And you can search and scroll for topics that interest you and certainly a fantastic list of guests that we have been fortunate enough to have on this show. While you're on our website, make sure you connect with us. As I mentioned earlier, if you'd like to schedule a conversation, we'd be happy to do that. Talk about your nonprofit organization and what's going on there or maybe, more importantly, your journey as a nonprofit leader. We've got coaching and training programs and a unique mastermind program that may be of interest. Also connect with us on our social media platforms. We're on most of them. And of course, give us your email address. And so you can get more information and free resources. We're producing generally once a week. Thank you for all you're doing in the nonprofit sector, and I hope you'll stay connected through this podcast. Don't miss out on any of our weekly episodes. They come out every Thursday, as well as bonus features we're producing about once a month. And if you like this episode, click on the Episodes button on the top of the page, and you can, again, check out thumbnails for all 126 previous podcast episodes. Thank you again for all you're doing in the nonprofit sector, especially right now. And thanks for your commitment to your professional development, which in turn builds on the powerful and important missions your organizations are trying to accomplish. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time on The Path.